Okay, good morning. Uh, my presentation is titled The Physics of History's Rangiest Artillery Gun. We're going to talk today about parabolas and history and war. Um, great. So on May 29th, 1918, uh, war is raging in Europe. It's World War I, but in France, it's a nice peaceful afternoon. It's Good Friday. Uh, hundreds of people have gathered in the Church of St. Gervais in Paris uh, for a mass service. And then the roof explodes. Uh, 91 people are killed, 68 more are injured, and people are not sure what just happened. This explosion, though, was not totally um, out of the blue. About a week earlier in mid-March, uh, Explosions had started to rock Paris, and between mid-March and early August of 1918, 368 such explosions occurred in the city. Uh, you see on a map to the left on your screen all the places where that happened. I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but uh, I think like this is roughly where the church was. Um, over the course of these attacks, uh, 257 civilians in Paris were killed. Um, hundreds more were injured, and the deadliest attack was the aforementioned attack on the church. Um, at first, Parisians looked upwards towards the sky. They figured maybe a couple German planes had gotten through the front line and started bombing the city, but they didn't hear or see any planes, and the furthest German position was about 75 miles to the northwest. So the big question that they had was, where was this coming from? And eventually, after the smoke cleared, if you will, they did an investigation on some of these explosion sites, and they found German shells. Uh, and this made no sense because shells didn't go more than 10 miles, and they were very far away. So the question that they asked, and the question that my project really asks on a basic level, is how the heck did this happen? So this is the part of the uh, project where I explain to you briefly World War I, because I think the context is important on a historical level. Uh, so World War I starts in 1914 when Franz Ferdinand is assassinated. It sparks a whole bunch of like complex diplomatic stuff. And by August of 1914, Europe's armies have mobilized and they're fighting each other because they have weird alliances. Um, they expected it to be a quick war, though. They figured, like, in the past, you, you know, you and the boys got on a couple of horses with some rifles, and, you know, you'd charge through and storm the palace, and it was over in a couple of weeks, a couple months, maybe. Very rarely a couple of years. So, in 1914, they figured, you know, this war will be over by Christmas. We'll all be home with our families. Uh, no big deal. Just another one of the wars that we're going to have. But by late 1914, the front line sort of became static. They had, this is a gross simplification, but they had a front line in Eastern Europe and a front line in Western Europe. Uh, in Eastern Europe, it was Germany against Russia. And in Western Europe, it's Britain and France against Germany. Um, and they dig in. They have like these big trenches and they try out a whole bunch of new cool weapons on each other. And a lot of people die and they don't make much progress at all. Um, but then in 1918, things start to change a little bit. Um, in Russia, there's a revolution, and the Soviet government takes Russia out of the war. But even that can't really save Germany. Germany, like, their supply lines start to get messed up, and they don't have a whole lot of will to fight anymore. And also, Americans arrive in Europe, uh, supporting the British and the French. Uh, this is around the same time that the shelling begins in Paris, which is notable. Uh, and then in 1918, in November, only a couple months later, the war ends with a ceasefire. Um, so, okay, this is wh what were German shells doing in Paris? That makes no sense. If they had this static front line, and the front line was 75 miles away from Paris, how the heck did German shells end up there? Um, just to illustrate this a little bit on your screen, there's a map. Um, all the shaded stuff is territory that changed hands. Um, even in the thickest parts, it's maybe about 10 miles wide. So you can see they're making, this is over the course of four years, they're making progress in meters, not in miles. Um, and so like for them to get from 
you know, from German territory to Paris is really quite crazy. That does like, it doesn't make sense, which is why they were so flabbergasted when it happened. So what do you do when you can't break through a front line? Well, it's big gun time. This is the Kaiser Wilhelm rail gun. Uh, most people just called it the Paris gun. It was able to launch shells at Paris from behind German lines about 75 miles away. They kept it in the woods. They had a team of people whose sole job was to man it and re rearm it and fire it and aim it. Um, and it fired shells at, I think it was 5,600 uh, feet per second, which works out to be like 1,600-ish meters per second. Um, this is a very powerful weapon. Um, and the world had never seen anything like it before. This is how the shells got to Paris. Okay, so how did it work? This is uh, projectile motion, the range. This is sort of like the very basic uh, high school physics version of it. This is on, a, on a, like a basic level how the gun worked. That's why it says kinda down here. Um, this equation works pretty well when you're in Deb's classroom and you're maybe rounding a little bit and you ignore some other factors and it's pretty small scale. Um, but when you're firing a, like a big shell across countries, uh, this starts to break down a little bit because of air resistance and different factors and conditions that are at play. So they had to modify it. After the war, um, the Americans tried to study these guns because uh, they were kind of blown away by it as well. Uh, so this colonel in the American army, he put together on a hundred page book, which if you're interested, I don't know, you can read it too, um, about artillery, specifically the Paris gun. Um, and he has this chart in here uh, where it has, this, this line is, not line, I guess this parabola where it says in vacuo line C is what would happen if you just took the Paris gun and you did your equation to it. It would go about 150 miles. Um, they use miles because they hate the metric system, which was confusing when I was doing the project, but whatever goes really far. Um, he compares it to parabola A, which is the farthest artillery. Uh, that had ever been fired. You can see it goes about 20 miles. That was kind of amazing at the time. Um, and then he compares it to B, which was the actual flight path of the Paris gun. Um, so what explains the difference between B and C, the theoretical and the real? Uh, and the answer is mostly air resistance. Um, you'll also see that he's set it at uh, an angle of 50 degrees. Uh, normally when we talk about ideal angle for maximum range, uh, it's going to be 45 degrees that, like, mathematically, that's how it works. But to negate air resistance, you set it at a higher angle, uh, which is what I'll talk about on the next slide. So I really like this graph. This is fun. It sort of illustrates everything that's going on. It has very rudimentary uh, air density um, calculations here. But it also compares the Paris gun to a whole bunch of other things that people in 1918 would have been familiar with, like airplanes and hot air balloons and Mount Everest. Um, it also talks a little bit about the curvature of the Earth, which changes the range by about half a mile, so it's notable at the very least. Um, and the calculation that they made and that the Germans made when they were designing and aiming the gun was that air resistance is going to slow the heck out of your uh, projectile. It's going to stop it well short of where it should go. Uh, so the question for how do we make it go as far as possible is how do we negate air resistance as much as possible? As it turns out, the air uh, resistance, the higher up you go, is lower. And there's a point at um, at, at, yeah, sorry, at about 12 miles uh, high where air resistance becomes negligible. So the question becomes, how do you get it to that point as quickly as possible so that you can, you know, lose as little uh, of your speed 
and your velocity uh, before you get to that point? And the answer is you get a higher um, launch angle. He set it at 50. I saw a bunch of different sources. Some said 50, some said 56. Most were at about 52 or 53. Um, and what it did was it sort of launched it up as quickly as possible. It gets to this higher point. Uh, and then it's able to fly further because it's at a point where there's less air resistance. And ultimately, the Paris gun, it's capable of firing a projectile about 70 miles um, from behind German lines all the way to a small church in Paris. So the gun itself, that was the, the physics portion of this project. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened to the gun, how it was used, what happened to it. Um, it was first deployed, as I said, in March. Um, it killed about 300 people. It was last fired in August. And the reason they stopped using it in August was because the Americans had arrived in Europe and the tide started to turn against the Germans. So the first real progress of the war was made. And the area in the woods where the Germans were keeping the gun was uh, being threatened. So they put it on a rail car and they shipped it back to Germany. When they signed the ceasefire in November, it was actually one of the 21 terms of surrender, was that the Germans would give the Allied forces the gun and all their plans to it. They never did this. The guns were destroyed back in Germany. Um, it left historians and uh, military engineers with little more than some documents. And they were actually able to recover the mounts. So they found, like, they had to mount these guns on something. They found those, like, in the woods on the battlefield. Um, the gun was pretty useless. It, it like it wasn't accurate. It uh, you know you could aim it at a city, but you couldn't aim it at a building. So they really just used it to terrorize the people of Paris. It wasn't like it couldn't accurately destroy military targets. So it was more of a propaganda tool than anything. Uh, that's why I've called it a mostly useless gun. Um, and it, uh, it didn't really have anything to do with the history of weaponry after that because people soon discovered uh, rocket technology, which let them change the path of a projectile while it was in flight. So it didn't really make sense to uh, keep just sort of wildly firing shells at long distances. Um, but it was sort of this cool historical moment where it was like they weren't quite there yet, but they still had a desire to do this. Um, so yeah, it was a bad idea, one of many in World War I. It had no impact on the war, but it killed some people. Um, I don't know, I guess the conclusion is that not all physics equations are 100% accurate and killing people is bad. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I actually, I wrote a paper along with this. Uh, I guess I didn't have to, but I'm bad at reading directions. So if you want to read my paper, you can do that. I also left some sources in the paper. So there are no, no sources on this uh, slideshow, but if you go to the paper and go to my bibliography, it's all in there. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I don't know, back to you. Dead. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm going to click, click the clapping hands and I almost clicked end meeting, which is very close to that. I didn't mean to do that, but very good. Very interesting. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's a really useful, um, interesting application of the, the range equation. And it, you know, it, taking into account that air fly higher, you know, you're avoiding that, that higher density air that's down lower. So, uh, all right. So, Jacob, I don't know that we have full time for your presentation, but do you want to give a review of, of what you did um, look into and, and what was maybe the most interesting points? If you take, you know, like five, five minutes or so to talk about that, if you, have, if you want to slide, you can. Um, and then people could, you know, maybe look at the rest of it in the hall. Everyone do this. Sure. That's, yeah, that works. 
I see. How do I prevent and share my screen? Do you guys see that? that yep. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, my project is about the physics of a winning dragster, top fuel dragster. I did some some background background info slides. I'm gonna skip them mostly, but I'll just I'll just hop on this one for a minute. This is just talking about two things that'll come up later. Um, just that the an internal combustion engine, the engine and on the most of, if not all, non-electric cars that everybody drives around on the street, and the clutch, which all non-electric cars also have. Um, cars, every whenever you drive your car, you gotta have a transmission because at different uh, times when you're driving, at different speeds, you want different sets of gears when you're connecting your. Uh, output of your engine to the rest of your drive shaft. And your drive shaft is kind of this little picture in the top right that's blue and gray. Um, let me see if I can. Oh yeah, this guy. This is kind of your drive shaft. There's your engine, goes through some gears, uh, goes to a little rod, which pretty much goes pretty quickly to your wheels. Um, but changing gears is not that easy when you're driving. You can't just you have two different size gears and they're working and then you switch out a different gear, they'll kind of grind together, you don't want that. So in between switching gears, you have two gears that are working nicely and then you get to stop the speed of the, you can disconnect the engine and the its output that it's turning one of the gears so you can mesh the speeds a little better. Um, and so that one, so that a gear that's more connected to the engine doesn't just keep going at the same speed and, and grind up chew up your, your little gear teeth um, so to stop the the gear that's more connected to the engine from grinding everything up and going really fast you disconnect it and then you do that with a clutch and that makes it really easy to do it all the time when you're driving and a clutch is is this is all a little bit a little bit try to do a, a quick simple explanation but the clutch is sort of it's, uh, it uses friction and it's one, the flywheel comes out of the engine, just connected to the engine, and then you have the clutch plate and a disc, and the clutch plate presses on the disc, and the disc presses on the flywheel, and the flywheel is getting turned by the engine. So if they're pressed together, they spin together, because the friction holds them pretty tightly together, and they just spin kind of in unison. Um, but once the, when you press the clutch pedal on your car, it lifts them apart for a second and the engine stops driving the gear so that you can switch the other gear and they don't chew each other up. If that makes any sense. Uh, and then the, this, you know, I'll just go back to that. I did a quick, what is drag racing? Drag racing is a quarter mile. Usually it can be a little bit different sometimes, but usually it's a quarter mile strip. It starts with two cars at a standstill. There's this little thing right here called a tree with lights. Um, it kind of counts down, and then it's the measurements for um, it, when you finish the race. The measurements that tell you who won are the time, the elapsed time. It's called the ET. Is how fast the car did the quarter mile. The faster the one wins, and then the other measurement that doesn't determine whether you won or not usually, but just is another helpful tool for drivers to tune their cars better is how fast you finish the race at. So one car might lose because it got a bad start, but it might have finished the race a lot faster. And then there's all different uh, classes of racing. I put just six of them here that felt like a wide range. You can race any car that you can drive on the street as long as it won't fall apart on the track. Then it goes, then there's a little bit faster super street, a little bit faster is pro stock and pro mod then Top Fuel Funny Cars, and we're going to talk about Top Fuel Dragsters today. Then I did just some fun stats about them. All right, so this is the basic anatomy of a Top Fuel Dragster. The nice thing is they're actually 
much simpler than a normal car in a lot of ways. Um, pretty much all you got is this chassis that's made out of chromoly, chromoly tubes. Um, in, in slower dragsters, you can be made out of steel, but this is lighter and stronger material. It's got little wheels in the front that don't do a whole lot, but do turn. That's how you can drive the car. It's got big wheels in the back. Those are the ones that it's rear wheel drive. So those are connected to the drive shaft. Drive shaft is, uh, yeah, this whole, the whole thing is pretty uh, condensed in here. There's the engine. Person would sit right about here. Um, they used to put the engines in front of people, but then every time they would explode, it was just not as good as putting them behind people. Um, there's a big wing here, some hard wing on the front, and a wheelie bar. So now, how do you design a winning dragster? So before you build it, there's a few things you're going to want to plan out. And there's some two physics equations that are going to be really, really important. Uh, and integral to planning your dragster. So the first one is figuring out how much power are you gonna need for your dragster to finish the quarter mile at a certain speed. Um, and I can explain this, but it's uh, the equation that you reach at the end of is the little derivation. Um, so this is not mine, but I also wrote it up. Um, and the, at the end you get V equals three X T uh, over M all to the one third. Um, oh, it's right here too. Um, and yeah, that's all. And power is in watts, and that's mass in kilos, velocities in meters per second, x is in meters. The usual, usual stuff there. And then the other important thing is wheelies are really, really dangerous because. When you have a car that gets a lot of traction and has a lot of power um, and has a bad center of gravity where something goes wrong um, and all the aerodynamic stuff is not working out for you so well, the front will lift up like this. Um, when the rear gets a lot of torque, the front lifts up and then sometimes they take flight and it's really bad. So there's another physics equation to uh, plan this one out and to figure out how, whether or not the dragster or wheelie. Um, and that is A over G equals this little sign, um, alpha, a lowercase alpha, um, times the wheelbase over the height of the center of gravity. Um, so yeah, G is acceleration due to gravity, WB is a wheelbase, H is the height of center of gravity, little alpha is the distance between the rear axle and the center of gravity, and this equation is not perfect, and neither is the last one, but they are they're pretty close, um, and they're, they're really important. This one doesn't take into account any of the little aerodynamic stuff, like the little wing on the front, or uh, just any of that kind of thing that's that's trying to help keep the keep the weight down, um, the front the weight on the front down. All right, so then the engines, these engines produce a crazy amount of horsepower and they're actually not any bigger than the engine that's in some cars. So these are 500 cubic inch engines and there are, there are some 500 cubic inch engines in some of the big muscle cars that you have probably seen on the street at some point. It's not very common, but uh, it is, it can happen. Um, but so how did these, engines produce, these engines produce 10,000 horsepower and uh, normal cars are like 100 to 200, maybe 300 horsepower. That's a real fast car. Um, J Jacob, I just interrupt you for a second. We are at 1130, just so you know. Okay, so all right, I'll just say this real quick and wrap up. But so these engines are really cool because they run on, instead of gas, they use nitromethane. And nitromethane is, uh, has a little bit of oxygen in it, so that's helpful, but it also just needs much less oxygen to combust compared to gas, um, and it has a high, uh, it's, it requires a lot of energy to combust, so it actually absorbs a ton of the heat in the engine, and uh, usually you have to cool engines, but you don't have to cool this engine because so much of the heat is, is absorbed from the combusting nitromethane, um, 
and so you don't need any channels throughout the, through the engine block for running water to cool it down which makes engine block much much stronger which is really important for making more power all right cool so if you want to learn more about that go to the uh exhibit hall is that what it's called yes cool. thanks so just before you guys hop off here, words to Jacob and to Ryan for presenting today. Thanks to all of you who have presented. Um, you're welcome to come back and see other presentations in Block 4 next week. They'll still be going on, and it looks like maybe even into the week after. Uh, so there's, you know, still going to be stuff up on the Google site about that. Um, so to wrap up our class, if you have not yet turned in problem set three, that is a graded problem set. It's okay to turn it in. Um, don't feel pressured that like, oh my gosh, if you didn't get it in yesterday, that that's a big disaster. It isn't a disaster. I just wanna make sure I have it from especially all the seniors before you um, go off on the project. And the second piece is you will see a Veracross link today that takes you to a self-evaluation for the project. So once you have, this doesn't apply to people who have not presented yet. Um, so if you haven't done your presentation yet and you're still waiting to do that, why don't you just wait? And um, that link is gonna be up on the Google project website. So you can also, a Google project, listen to me, physics project website. So you can go there after you've given your presentation and do the self-evaluation. But I think by now all the 12th graders have, on um, done their presentation so you can go ahead and do that self eval for me and then I guess just the last thing I want to say is it's been delightful teaching blog for we have had a great time I think um, I do miss you know seeing all of you in person and um, all the you know kind of random drop-ins that that we'd have in all of our adventures in class together so I I do now miss you and I will continue to do so so don't be strangers um, you know, email me and I'm sure I will see you again before this calendar year is out, uh, whether it's at a commencement ceremony or some other thing, I'm hoping to see you soon. So there is only one way to end block four to say goodbye to the seniors. And that would be to say, Roger over and out. <laughs> Bye, Deb. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Have a good Bye. weekend. Thank you. Thank you.